the rumors are true? Yes. No. <laughs> I this kidnapped isn't... you and oh. in your own house. <laughs> that's what I was oh, going to say. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Go with that. I know. I know it's funny. That's why like, you, please see, help me. You got to trust me. Hello, everybody. It is Kalaxin here. If you guys enjoyed this video, remember that you guys should subscribe. Follow us over on social media. Check out our patrons to keep the light. <laughs> Our patrons know our life. Oh boy, you're fumbling. That was so good. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It is Kalaxin here. If you guys enjoy this video, remember to subscribe, follow us over on social media, and check out our Patreons to keep the lights on. So, the rumors are true. I, Kalaxin, have kidnapped Murder of Birds in his own house. Yep. He is locked up. He's under house arrest. Someone come save me, please. <laughs> he needs rescuing. How's everybody doing? Glad to be here. I mean, glad to be here in my <laughs> own house, in my own office, in this chair while you're in mine, but it's fun. I've taken just everything from him. His office, his chair, his dignity. That's why we're all here. The best days of my life. <laughs> all right, so, so what are we here for? What are we doing? We are doing a Ruby community interview. And so if you guys have seen these before, we have done this with That Kaito Dan, with Portal 64, with Unicorn of War, and now we're on to Arnie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she's wanted to do this for a while, but I've always felt that it'd be odd to do an interview if we weren't in person. And even when she came here, we, we didn't plan like, hey, you're going to come over. We're going to spend the week together and we're going to do this. It just sprung up on her at the last minute. So I have no idea what questions she's going to ask me. Um, so I'm kind of in the hot seat right now. Uh, I'm assuming it's going to be along the lines of what she's done with, like she said, Kaido Dan, Unicorn of War, etc. Uh, really quick, though, uh, I definitely want to talk about this because we mentioned it on social media and some people uh, picked up on it right away. Some people are surprisingly still confused shout out to that one person that was just like i love your new office cal <laughs> it looks like murder of birds it's well, completely he... serious like they were not joking yeah so they I... just thought i up and moved kaylin and i originally met what was it after ruby volume 5 so yeah. february of 2018 yes uh after ruby volume 5 that's where i like met her got acquainted and we became friends we met that following year at rtx that was your first rtx i, I yep. believe that was my third rtx um, that's where we met. And from RTX last year to RTX this year, we were kind of close. We were basically talking on Discord all the time, yep. um, talking about everything from Ruby to Kingdom Hearts to just constantly being in contact with each other. And like, obviously, she mentioned that she liked me. I was actually, you know, I ended up liking her as well uh, as relationships go. And we've officially been together together since RTX yep. 2019. I haven't said anything about it and she's wanted to tell the whole world. Um, but that usually just, that really just came down to me personally. Um, I know I'm a content creator. I know I'm an online personality, but there are certain aspects about me, like my personal friends, my family relationships that I just don't want people knowing everything about me, like all of my business. And so, especially because I'm a content creator, she's a content creator. We're both on social media. We're both on YouTube. So I felt like it was inevitable to just at least mention and get out there like, hey, yeah, we're dating. It's not that big of a deal. That That's basically it. We've been dating officially since RTX. Some people like Justin and David have known. Um, other people are just finding out now. They're like, what? Since when? How come no one told Obviously, me this? Obviously, Hunter knows and like yeah. has uh, made fun of me. <laughs> yeah. So like RTX was in Ju July and we're now in October. So this has been... This is, we're just kind of mentioning it now because it's kind of like everything's out of the way. And the fact that she's here and what, Miraculous came out. Yeah, Miraculous uh, came out while I was here. And so, so like I was like, you know what would be really funny as like a, like a soft confirm is if you recorded a video at my house when no one knew you were coming here. So here we are. Um, this is clearly not my office. I did not move. A couple people on Twitter actually thought that this was my space now. It is not. Um, I came basically to visit my boyfriend, and so now I am here. If you guys don't know, that is Murder of Birds. Uh, he has his own channel, which is why he has his own setup. So when I heard that Miracle Queen was going to air while I'm here, I was just like... <laughs> I'm gonna use your stuff. Yeah, so that is why we are here. And then just kind of let people speculate. And then some people just didn't get the message. Like, she's at Arnold's house because she's dating Arnold and she's there to visit him. Basically, she and I are together and uh, she's been here for about four or five days. She goes home in a couple more days and she wanted to do this video and put it together. So just wanted to clear the air on that. Yes, we're dating. Um, I don't, you know, it's not really like a celebrity thing. Like, I understand that, like, I'm a content creator. I'm well known in the community uh, as well as she, but... 
I don't know. I, I It doesn't feel any different to me because we've been talking for so long yeah. that even when she came here, she was like, what did you say? I was just like, Arnold, I feel like I've always lived here. Yeah. Like that I've never lived at, like that I've just always been here. Yeah. Cause like we're always on discord and she's seen my house like on video, like I've done a house tour and even on discord, I've shown her like live feeds of like certain rooms and stuff like that. So it doesn't feel any different. You know what I mean? It's only going to feel different when she's actually not here because we've been, you know, we've been going out to dinner. We went to the movies. We, uh, we've been hanging out here and there watching YouTube videos. We're actually doing a video together now. Um, we're going to go out for lunch and then dinner later today and basically just kind of close out the rest of the week before she goes back home on Sunday. I'm rambling, so I'm going to stop doing that. <laughs> so basically, guys, if you have seen these before, the usual format is sort of asking about how the content creator got involved with Ruby ruby related sort of fandomy questions and then like last year we talked about volume six we'll probably maybe talk about volume seven a little but not as yeah. much as previous um but first and foremost arnold so how did you get involved with rooster teeth and ruby i feel like i've explained this so many times and i still haven't made my own dedicated video on the topic i've talked about it as ruby has gone on i've also recently just kind of went down the rabbit hole of talking about it with red versus blue season 10 because the finale of RVB season 10, um, after the finale of that back in what, 2011, 2012, is when they debuted the red trailer. Right, right, right. And so me watching the last 10 seasons of RVB, it kind of came around full circle. Like Ru Ruby is what got me into red versus blue, but red versus blue is what paved the way for Ruby. Yeah. So it kind of comes around full circle. So basically June 1st, 2013, the yellow trailer came out. The yellow trailer was the first ruby thing i'd ever seen mm -hmm. one day walked into my brother's room he was watching the yellow trailer and the animation and the aesthetic of it i thought it was a video game so i was like what video game is that he's like it's not a video game it's an anime it's on crunchyroll it's ruby and i was like holy shit, that looks awesome so we watched the so i ended up watching the yellow trailer the rest of it with him and then i watched all four trailers back to back to back to back to back and the, the one thing that stuck out to me was Monty Ohm because I originally discovered Monty through Haloid and Dead Fantasy prior. Or I think it was Dead Fantasy first and then Haloid, even though I think Haloid came out first. And so Monty was the name that stuck with me. I watched all of volume one as it came out week to week by myself on Crunchyroll. I wasn't a part of the community. I didn't have a Rooster Teeth account. I didn't have anybody, anyone anywhere that talked about Ruby. I was very much in my own bubble. Yeah. And so halfway through volume one, I was going on YouTube and I wasn't seeing a whole lot of people like there was I, I want to be like straight up in, in saying this like when Ruby volume one was out there was maybe three four people talking about it yeah Jake one man band hey there everybody Jake from the one man band here and you know what time it is that's right as you can tell by my shirt it is time for a awesome Ruby episode in-depth look review Thing, tell us, extravaganza. The hero kid. So guys, it's time for a review of RWBY episodes three, four, and five. Uh, it's a triple episode review. I need to start knocking these episodes out so I can get caught up to where uh, the series is now uh, because I'm very late because I've been working on other stuff. Um, but yeah, so let's get to it. Let's start off with episode three. Episode three was kind of the least eventful of all of them. GR Arcada did a, a podcast, Podtaku, that covered the first three episodes of volume one. Hello and welcome to this very special episode of JTaku. Today we will be talking about the internet sensation that is Ruby. There was a channel called Invisible Katana. All right, so this episode I would consider to be our first truly epic episode of Ruby and the first thing that really caught me was the fact that it was like uh, 12 or 13 minutes long which we haven't had of course since the very first episode and maybe chibi reviews i don't know if chibi reviews covered volume one but i know he started with volume two at least hello everybody it's chibi and today i'm going to be doing something very very special i'm going to be reviewing ruby season two episode one now, if you don't know by now, I am a massive Rooster Teeth fan. I've been following them since the first time they had Season 1 of Red vs. Blue. And getting to see Ruby Season 2 finally air, I sat down and I'm saying like, you know what, I'm going to freaking review this. Because I do review anime constantly, so I was like, this can technically kind of be considered an anime if you look at it at a different standpoint. And so... I'm going to be reviewing this. So nobody was covering this show like any other anime. And some and of those names, like, you don't hear about 
Yeah. More like I I know who Jake One Man Band is, but other than that, it's like yeah. who are those people? They're yeah, a lot of them are really like the OG like first people who start like and Jake was the Ruby guy. You know what I mean? Like Jake was the when you thought of Ruby back during the early volumes, Jake was the content creator. Yeah. You know, much like nowadays, there's so many more personalities. Myself, Eruption Fang, that Kaito Dan yourself. You know what I mean? So like community and I guess the the content creation of Ruby yeah. from the fandom's perspective, especially on YouTube, was so much different. But yeah, I started with volume one, the yellow trailer that got me into it halfway through the volume. I already had my channel. I created my channel actually like a month before Ruby started. At that point, I was already doing gaming videos and anime discussions. And then halfway through Ruby, I was like, I really like this show. I don't know. I, and no one knew the potential of it. You know what I mean? I yeah. didn't know it was going to be super successful, a worldwide phenomenon, because when Ruby succeeds, in a way that success bleeds into my channel yeah. because you know I'm a big creator in the in the community now. And yeah, so following volume one, I became a Rooster Teeth first member. Uh, I started watching a lot of the RT podcasts. I, I knew, uh, you know, I discovered people like Barbara. Mm -hmm. I got to learn more and, you know, see more of Monty. It was really the Rooster Teeth podcast that yeah. I pivoted off of for, for Ruby and then after volume three, I was like red versus blue and the rest is pretty much history now. Cause that was my second question was like, if you look back at Arnold's channel far enough, you'll find like the anime stuff, don't, the gaming don't, stuff, don't watch those, stuff. don't watch those. And so those. that's part of my research is embarrassing people with their old videos. But yeah. so what made you want to start Ruby videos and did you already know like what you were going to do? Like, did you know, look at it and be like, okay, it's volume three, it's time to do reactions. Like what was the YouTube scene at that point for reactions? So, I get this question a lot. And the question is, Murder, I can't find your volume one and volume two reviews. Where, you know, are they still on your channel? And the thing is, nobody on YouTube was really doing reactions in yeah. 2012, 2013. Somewhat, 2014 was where the trend really started happening. And that was where there was a lot of um, animosity towards reactions because there were some people on YouTube who would simply do reactions, sit there, add no commentary, add, add nothing to the video yeah. itself. You know what I mean? Like. I don't want to drop names, but people know those type of individuals and that those people were the ones that were getting like tens of thousands yeah. of millions of views. So they were basically the face of reactions and that put a bad light on reactions in general. And it kind of made me feel ashamed. Like I never wanted anyone to like, I had a YouTube channel and it was probably like a whole year before I told my friends and like even my mom, I didn't tell my mom until like it really blew up like when Rooster Teeth, you know, did yeah. their reaction to my reaction once there was like actual success to be had, you know what I mean? With yeah. with the channel and the blow up and all that stuff. So simply doing reactions at that time made me feel very inadequate. I felt like I wasn't really providing commentary or content in general. And to be honest, the content that I wanted to do was far more ambitious than the skills that I had at the time yeah. to do them. Like now I really kind of want to look at the content that I did in the past, like some gaming videos that I thought were really great and interesting. I have the commentary skills to be able to fulfill that. Whereas when I started my channel, I was learning how to YouTube while I was YouTubing. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say like my video, my early videos are shit because I look at people, you know, two channels that really inspired me for the gaming stuff was Girl Gone Gamer, which is Raya. She wants to. Uh, she doesn't do gaming commentary, but Girl Gone Gamer and Like Butter, they both did gaming commentary. The wait is over. It's finally here. Gears of War 3 has arrived. I went to the midnight release, and uh, there wasn't too many people. And I'm thankful to have this game. It's a great game. I'm going to talk about it, although I have some mixed feelings about a few things. And uh, if you haven't seen any of my videos before, my name is Like Butter. I do commentary for Gears of War 1. I did some Gears 2, and uh, now that Gears 3 is out, I'm going to be doing a lot of Gears 3 commentaries. Girl Gone Gamer did Call, Call of Duty, uh, Like Butter did Gears of War, and they did gaming like they did gaming videos with commentary on a topic. Yeah, yeah. So I used to read, I used to watch those, and I'm like, this is so easy. You know what I mean? Like I can do that, and hopefully, you know. And gaming was already an oversaturated, you know, slice of of YouTube as yeah. a whole. So it was already hard to get discovered, and I was just shit at commentary because I was super self conscious at talking to a camera, talking to myself. That is essentially, clearly not a problem now. Yeah, it's not a problem now because like now <laughs> I I just I never shut the hell up. So, yeah. but yeah, um. It, 
it started with video game content and then gaming started becoming kind of like a chore i wasn't as good as you know with the competitive gaming which was what really intrigued a lot of people back then like 100 plus kill gameplays of call of duty and stuff like that so then i transitioned to anime and manga because i used to watch anime daily i used to do i did so many reviews on anime like ruby and i know someone is gonna be like ruby's not an anime i'm just saying it as a formality so ruby um sort of online attack on titan uh, Log Horizon, Beyond the Boundary, like I did a lot of full season anime reviews and I just threw Ruby into the fold because it was it was special, it was charming, it was cute, it, it had no business being as popular as it was. And to be honest, I didn't realize its popularity until I got into the community during volume two, right? Yeah. I joined Facebook groups, I would see all this cool fan art, volume two is also where um, I discovered what shipping was, I actually had no idea because I don't really care for romance. You know what I mean? Like, I don't really care who ends up with who. I don't have this, you know, this, this, uh, this mindset of like, you know, he looks super cute and she looks super cute and they would look cute together. Like I, I that's just not me. So, uh, shipping was something that I discovered and understood like the nature of how it works. Yeah. And it was kind of not weird, but it was just like, I was like, oh, that's interesting. Even though those two characters never interacted, someone ships them. That's and the the the, the shipping names is probably the coolest part of, of shipping for me. So yeah, transitioning that into anime, um, into reactions. I did do reactions to certain anime. Now the quality was below par. The quality is something that would probably not be like accepted nowadays because I had a really shitty mic. I had a really shitty webcam that was built into my laptop and the whole package was just shitty overall because it was super outdated. But uh, I did- Did they see the screen when you're no, reacting? No, 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 no. So, so the, only, the only thing it was, it was you could hear me and you can hear a distorted, like, cause it was ran off of my laptop speakers. Right, right. So the mic would pick up the audio coming out of my laptop. So it was like, it was, a recurring like it was just like oh, it was it was picking up feedback right and it worked oh they're straight grilling him <laughs> oh snap jing freaks dude yo he looks like a boss without his like his turban on and everything <laughs> Twenty minutes. <laughs> Damn, that's a, an amazing view. Beautiful view. Hell yeah. Can I ask you something? I might not give you an answer though. I can't like stop smiling, dude. That which I cannot see in front of me right now. You know what I mean? I worked with what I had at the time and that's something that I would tell anybody is like, even if you have a shitty mic, have a shitty webcam, it'll develop and grow because now I have the 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 tools that I feel like yeah. are adequate to get, you know, to, to be able to succeed on YouTube. So um, I, I did reactions for the Naruto manga. I did reactions for Hunter x Hunter, which is my favorite anime of all time. I got into it super late, but I got into it from the time I picked it up to the end. Um, and so by that point, I was like, okay, I've done reactions for a few things. By that point, volume one and two had gone by. I did yeah. full reviews of both of those. That's why I didn't do reactions. For those of you who are wondering, no one did reactions back then. So I didn't feel it, it just wasn't a part of the, the YouTube ecosystem. So then my channel was pretty dead for, for most of 2015. And then, but I always knew I'd go back to Ruby volume three. And then yeah. for volume three, I was like, okay, reviews have been going great. Volume one and volume two are in the bag. Volume three, I'll do reviews for, but I want to start doing reactions for volume three. You know, for volume three, I was like, oh, it'd be like a new coat of paint for my content. You know, the rest was history at that point. And then every year I try to improve. It's like volume four, I started doing the live stream discussions. Yeah. Volume five, I, I wanted to do like, TLDR reviews and then that's when I started handling more than I could than I could handle. I ramble. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I would ask that if you were thrown into basically like a different universe, okay, where okay. you didn't exist and your channel didn't exist. Hold on, I'm okay. getting there. But we all existed. Like so you would basically be thrown into the volume seven sort of climate. Yeah. yeah, we're not gonna get into butterfly effect because I'm sure some people wouldn't like have started without Arnold, but we're not getting into that. So yeah. if you started now for volume seven with the current like editing skill set and like the equipment that you have, yeah. would you start doing reactions? Like what what would you basically start? I... Doing? Like would you still do what you do now or would you do something else? I would probably still do what I do now. I'd probably do, cause it's hard, right? Like I, I've been making Ruby content since volume one. So I have the catalog, the history of, of like 
all of my thoughts at the time yeah. up to where we are now. But starting something at its seventh volume, you still have to think like, well, how long is this going to go on for? Ultimately, I, I, I never made reactions for Ruby or anything like that in the hopes of it growing and becoming successful like it did. That it, that was just what happened. Yeah. But um, yeah, I would still do very much. I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be as gung ho about it because it probably wouldn't be what keeps the lights on for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it would probably, it would most likely be a pastime thing that I do, like a, a hobby thing that I do in my spare time. But yeah, I, I would still want to contribute like reactions and reviews at the very least yeah. for weekly content because I feel like if all of you guys were around, you guys would basically be doing those things anyway. Yeah. So you know what I mean? Like I, I do feel very fortunate and. I feel like a lot of luck was placed in where I am right now because I don't know what I would have done had had what happened didn't happen. You know yeah. what I mean? Like the shout outs, the support, the community. And I feel like this if this happened in any other space, like the gaming space or whatever, it would have just been a, a fluke. It would have come and gone. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it was great that I was able to harness the support that was given to me and the support and love that was shown by Rooster Teeth and, and the community. And, um, you know, I try to just contribute as much as I can to yeah. to kind of show and reciprocate the those feelings. So, yeah, that, that's really weird. I, I, I actually don't know how, it, you know what I mean? Like, because yeah. there are certain people in the community that I'm just wondering. I, I just, I, it, it would feel empty without them. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I, I would feel like the community would be really empty with some people. And you mentioned Jake Woman Bandit. He's, you know, he's back on on YouTube and he's like getting his sea legs back with, with doing videos and he was one of those people because he inspired me to make these Ruby videos yeah. and to want to be better because at the time he was my rival, you know what I mean? He had more views than I did, he had more subscribers than me, He was we were both talking about the same things but he did things a million times better and I was just like, damn man, I want to be able to like chase him, you know what I mean? I want to be able to do what he does and he had such a great community of people who loved watching all of the videos that he made and he's the og you know what i mean like whether people want to acknowledge that or not and i'm pretty sure there were people that got into doing this because of jake and i know yeah. that there are people who've come up to me and been like hey you inspired me to do reaction videos you know i, I loved watching your volume three reactions and that's why i do them now and you know it's just you know you're just passing the puck to yeah. you know everybody else and in turn it it you know, everybody wins. You know what I mean? Uh, what What's the phrase? Uh, a high tide raises all ships. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's, 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 that's kind of how I think about it's it. Like, there's so many people and they do so many different types of content yeah. now. And so it's like, if you could change to something like, you know, sort of doing like a breakdown. I'll be complete. Along Eruption Fang and what he does. I, okay, so so I'll, I'll elaborate on that. And I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be the first one to say this. I'm so envious of Eruption Fang. I love Cold Here's to Death. Here's the tea, guys. I love Cold to Death. Like, I, I, I love him. I know people give him shit. Get, people give him flack on his opinions and how he addresses certain things. I know Cole on a personal level, whereas many other people know him as Eruption Fang, know him through his content yeah. and not him as a person. He has such a fucking knack for addressing his thoughts in a clear, concise, and almost convincing way that makes you feel like he's thinking what you're thinking. Or, or he convinces you of, of his opinion of, of a certain thing. Like one of my favorite videos of his is, is Whitley a victim. When it comes to Ruby and its villains, or at least it's not liked characters, I don't think I can exactly classify someone like Jacques as a villain, more so just not a good person. I myself like to try and find the shining light in these characters, whether or not it actually exists. Are some of these characters really as bad as they're made out to be? Or are we just taking them at face value, not really digging deep enough? Whitley is a character that since his introduction, I actually really liked him. Though the response from many fans has been the opposite, Whitley didn't strike me as the malicious I want to rule the world on a business type character as was Jacques. He more so striked me as a potential victim. So to do what I like to do, I'm gonna say, what if Whitley isn't really a bad character? Like I used to fucking hate Whitley after volume four, but then I watched his video on Whitley and I'm like, I'm really looking forward to volume seven to see how Whitley develops as a character, yeah. if he is going to be this shitty, you know, mini me of Jacques, or if he is just the product of uh, the victim of his father's yeah. upbringings, you know what I mean? And unlike Weiss and Winter, who were able to get away from that, Whitley is just like, Stuck. you know what I mean? He's, yeah. he's shackled. So, you know, I, I think Eruption Fang has a great knack for breakdowns and theories. And those are the two things that I struggle with. I, I feel like, for me at least, it's too artificial for me to break down my thoughts into word form. That's why I ramble so much yeah. because it's like, 
I know what I want to say in the moment, but I can't figure out a way of minute like breaking down my my rambles into four to five sentences that convey the same thing as if yeah. I rambled. You know, and everyone doesn't have time for rambles. So I think I look at Eruption Fang's videos and I'm like, fuck man, like he just he just has it. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm super proud of him. I'm super happy. He just passed 110,000 subscribers. He got a silver play button. Super proud of him. You know, I'm 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 straggling behind, but I I'll, I'll definitely get there uh, as well. But I that's the content that I like. Uh, a lot of, another thing that I really enjoy are like lore videos, like yeah. of franchises that I don't even follow, like Legend of Zelda, um, Five Nights at Freddy's. That's you know, amazing. lore videos like that. And I feel like those are the videos that I consume, but I can never make those kind of videos. I wouldn't be able to do them justice. And I think Eruption Fang at least does justice. I would love to be able to live in a different universe where I can do what he does because I think he does it really well. I think the other thing, like, uh, I guess to get off topic, Eruption Fang knows how to pivot. Yeah. To an extent. Like, oh with my the God. Ruby and then pivoting Borderlands. to Borderlands. I think he pivoted at the perfect time, and too, because so, Borderlands, the hype of Borderlands yeah. 3, he got his first 1 million view video with his. The, the Borderlands timeline video. I can't even begin to understand how he made the script. I suck at scripts. Scripts are the worst part of any endeavor for me with with wanting to make a video of that of that caliber. But like the script, the the timeline, getting everything like, no, he didn't miss a beat. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I and I would have so many holes in 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 mine. Also, I'm not really into like border. I, I don't think any type of video like even Ruby. I feel like I'm a walking talking encycl Ruby encyclopedia, yeah. but I don't think I could even do a Ruby timeline justice. Mm -hmm. Um in the same way that I feel like he eventually will when he does a video like that cuz I I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's going to he did it for Red versus Blue yeah. as well. And once I'm caught up, I'm gonna watch that. But yeah, um, I know I feel like I'm I'm giving a lot of like I'm kind of like giving him a whole lot of love, but like he's he's a, another big rival that I that I look up to and and someone that uh, that inspires and, and challenges me a lot. I was actually gonna ask later, so near the end, but with the pivoting thing, like I know that you want to get into other yeah things like pivot over to like my hero academia like anime <laughs> like stuff like that yeah so um, i i don't necessarily think it's pivoting as much as it is getting back to my roots yeah anime and manga and video games is what started my channel and ruby was just a beautiful coincidence yeah. that kind of took center stage because it's the content that ninety thousand people subscribe to me for and it's the content that um, does the best on my channel and it's the content that I'm the most passionate about covering. I'm not a gaming channel, I'm not an anime reviewer by any means, but I feel like eventually I do want to pivot. It's just a matter of managing my time because I am one person and so I don't put too much on my plate, right? Like when Ruby's done, I focus on Red versus Blue. When Red vs. Blue is done, I kind of focus on some Twitch gaming and try to bring some some of those gameplays over to YouTube like I've done with like God of War, Kingdom Hearts 3, yeah. Persona 5 I'm doing right now. So it's it's kind of hard to be able to do as much as I want to because in a way I become a slave to my own ambition. And yeah. eventually I don't do anything that I want to do because, um, you know, everything that I look at is content. You know, a video game comes out. Oh, I'm not going to play that now because that would be a great game to stream. I'd be able to make content out of that. I'd be able to benefit from that. And my viewers would be able to benefit from that. Same thing with anime. I haven't watched anime since Ruby really took off for me after volume three. And... I just kind of, I got to just pace myself and I do want to hurry, I, I'm not hurry, but I do want that pivot to happen eventually because Ruby will eventually end, yeah. RVB will eventually end. The one thing that I think of as mu more than I probably should and more times than off than not is what am I going to do when Ruby ends? Yeah. What am I going to do? Yeah, mainly when Ruby ends because Red versus Blue is this high, is, you know, it's just this this cruise control series that I'm watching because it's so far in the future from where I yeah. am now. But Ruby, I'm constant with, I'm up to date with, and I don't know when it's gonna end. And when it eventually ends, you know, that's gonna be like a, a channel that focuses on one thing and one thing only. And then when it ends, the channel will eventually end too, because not yeah. everyone is into everything you do. That's why they subscribe for Ruby. And I hope that pivoting will migrate some of those people into the other things that I enjoy doing Does as well. Does that freak you out? Because, I mean, I've seen channels focus on one thing and die. Like, not to be over dramatic, I guess, yeah. but I've seen a lot of channels, they focus on, like, say, one game, and then that game doesn't make any more games, let's say, and they try to do other stuff, but they can't get them invested. So do you think it's sort of a time-sensitive, like, you have to do this in the next couple of years before... Because I would think that you have to do it before Ruby ends. Yeah, I mean, I've already slowly started pivoting in a way, uh, at least with Twitch. Yeah. Twitch is mainly for gaming-centric uh, content, and 
I could easily see myself becoming a full-time Twitch streamer if that was the case, yeah. but my core audience is on YouTube and I never want to feel like I'm abandoning my core audience for something that I feel I could succeed better on. Yeah. Also, Patreon is the lion's share of why I'm able to do anything. And ultimately, it's really that support. And I'm, I'm actually baffled by how generous a lot of people are. And I really do think like it's based on the community, like the Rooster Teeth community and that community embracing me yeah. and then me building what I've done over the last six, seven years at this point with Ruby, going into volume seven especially. I know that there are people that come and go and I appreciate the support when they give it to me, but there are those people that have just been here from the beginning and I genuinely feel like I don't know where I'd be without them. So it, it's, I owe it even more to them to want to be able to pivot and to be able to be successful and not have to depend on my community forever. Because I, you know what I mean? Like even before any of this, you know, I'm no slave, I'm no stranger to hard work, but I, you know, I worked at McDonald's, I worked at a pizza place, I've worked nine to five, six to twos, two to tens. So I, you know what I mean? I know what that's like and I would have no problem going back to that, but it would just be such a whiplash experience yeah. because I've been able to do what I can be passionate about and enjoy and, you know, it, it, it's something that I always do think about. And um, I feel like I'd be okay. I, I will be okay. It's just a matter of, you know, taking things one step at a time and, and managing my time in a, in a more productive way as, as time goes on. And I, to go back to what you were saying before, like making everything out of content, like obviously that's something that you want to do <sighs> yeah. and that you want to do that but do you also feel pressure from I guess the outside audience like for example we were watching Black Mirror and the mere mention of Black Mirror had people like Arnold you have to do a reaction and so it's sort of like yep. does that who pressures you more is it yourself or is it sort of the audience that wants you to react it's, to something it's, it's partially those two things but a big part of it is the success that I see from other people oh. In a way, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Because I see it as like, so there are other reaction channels out there that I personally partake in and watch for shows that I've already seen, like Ruby, uh, Death Note, Full Metal Alchemist. Yeah. I'm watching a series right now. Um, so the three channels that I that I kind of look to for that type of mindset is Blind Wave, Semblance of Sanity, and RTTV. They all cover anything from TV shows to anime to movies. And I look at that because there's a lot of stuff that I haven't experienced. People like flip their shit and are like, Arnold, are you serious? You've never seen Lord of the Rings. You've never seen every single episode of Star Wars, you know, the, the trilogy series. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of things like, oh my God, Arnold, you still haven't watched My Hero Academia. <laughs> yeah. And I just look at that as, I look at that as potential. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because in the same way that Ruby was a big potential hit for my channel because I, I'm so passionate and I and I and I'm dedicated to the series and I love it to to death. It is something that unfortunately I feel like a lot of content creators who are in the same yeah. vein as me do that for. Um, you know, it's like, hey, I'm gonna hold off on that because that could be a, a good thing to kind of make content out of. And if yeah. and if that is successful on my channel, then it benefits everyone. It benefits me, it benefits the viewers, and it's kind of like a time capsule because then I, I always go back to and look at some of my earlier reactions of like Ruby and like what did I think at the time or it's yeah. just a great way to also see the progress that I've made over the years. So yeah, I, I feel like it's, it's threefold. It's partially me, it's partially the audience because I know if they want it enough, then I'll be able to deliver on that. But then it's also, wow, holy shit, their series did really well. Like, you know, like they watched that entire anime series. They didn't have any copyright issues. It's forever immortalized on their channel. It brings yeah. them viewers. And, you know, they're able to bounce off to another series once that one's done. So I look at a lot of what other people are doing and I feel like that's something every content creator should be doing. You should be looking at what your quote unquote competition is doing. You should look at what your friends are doing. Um, whether it's something that you can adopt and make your own or if it's something that you should avoid. You know, you should be looking at what people are doing for better or worse. You want a piece of this miraculous ladybug pie, Arnold? No. <laughs> no. No, not, not at all. <laughs> anyway, so let's move on now to some fandom-related okay. questions, okay? Right. You talked about shipping already. <sighs> I know. But is there no one, not even just Ruby, in the universe where you're like, damn, like those two people no. look good together. Like Sora and Kyrie, no. Roxas and Shion, like no. nobody. I, I promise. This baffles me, I okay? promise you, Kaylin. I promise you with everything in me, I have never in my entire life have ever cared 
about person A and person B getting together. It's like, even Kingdom Hearts, right? Kingdom Hearts, up until Persona 5, Kingdom Hearts was my favorite video game series of all time. I saw it, you know what I mean? I yeah. can see the the writing on the wall, you know, like, the Palpu fruit, you know, you know, Sora and Kairi don't ever change, you know what I mean? I can understand how they felt about each other as kids, and growing up, those feelings would only become stronger, especially yeah. because Kairi's always being taken away, and Sora's always having to go and rescue her. I, I can understand that, but there's no part of me that's like... Oh my gosh, I hope they're together in the end. I hope they live happily. Uh, that You know what I mean? Like, And, and that's yeah. fine. You know what I mean? I, it's just romance in general for me isn't something that I that I cling to in, in terms of fiction. And, you know, I'm not throwing shade at anyone because I know, yeah, like, yeah. you... I mean, it just baffles me because, like, obviously this is... I mean, you also have to understand, like, it wasn't until 2014 that I found out what shipping yeah, was. Yeah, I guess. It's just, like, so I talked and about it was from the, the And it was from the episode in Volume 2... Where, oh, like, where they, they were like, the Bumble, when they did yeah, the ship yeah. names, I was like, oh, shoot, that's cool. They're doing team attack names. And then, like, people are like, oh, no, those are the shipping names for the characters. I'm like, shipping? Yeah, you mean, you know, like, rela <laughs> relation shipping? And I'm like, oh, okay. And I had no idea there was a there was a part of the fandom that was, that was so gung-ho for shipping in general. Yeah. And it was something that I discovered. I mean, I talked about this in a video we did. I don't remember. I think it was actually like an Ariel and Sora shipping video. But like for me as a six year old, I was just like, yes, they both belong together. And even like Kim Possible, like Shigo and like and just like shipping stuff like that. Like that was already like in my brain, even though I didn't know what shipping was. So it's always weird when I'm like, there's nothing. There's no <laughs> one where you're like, they're cute, Arnold. Like, come on. I just I, I always just looked at a show like because you mentioned Kim Possible. I, I watched that show on and off, and I always would just assume, like, they're going to be together by the end. A lot of pre But you had no urge for them to be no. together. You just knew that no, it was No, no, no. Like, I, and there was just a lot of preteen shows that I watched back in the day, like Kim Possible, Zoe 101 was yes, another one. Exactly. Like, Zoe and Chase. In my head, I'm like, as I'm watching the show, I'm like, from a writer's perspective, <laughs> it would make sense to put these two main characters together he has feelings for her she does she she doesn't know that it, it just it just makes sense right and so like i just i just watch it happen it's not it's never something that but you I, weren't I'm like you weren't in. screaming about no. zoe and chase all no. right like when he moved to the uk yep. and then she and came then she back came to back. america yep. like that's the stuff that makes me like lose my shit yeah no like for me it's just it's just I have no, there's nothing in me that's like yearning for this to happen. Yeah. It, it just, it, it just happened. I embrace it. That's so the only thing that I can really say. From that perspective, like, what do you think about like the shipping part of the fandom? <laughs> like, do you sort of look in on us and be like, wow, they're crazy? No, no, like, no. You seeing me in the <sighs> videos and the ships that we've come up with sometimes, aren't you just like, wow, Cal's like. So here, <laughs> here's, here's, here's what I'll, here's what I'll say. Because, and this is probably going to be a bit of a, a lengthy sure. response. I love how we were just in <laughs> sync right there. We shared the one brain cell, but not the I shipping brain cell. have never judged somebody for caring about a guy and a guy, a girl and a girl, a guy and a girl. Right? Um, there was a point in time, I would say around volume four where it started to get under my skin a little bit. And it wasn't getting under my skin for any, you know, because I'm like, because I'm homophobic, you know, I'm, not, I'm none yeah. of those things. My mother would beat my fucking ass if she ever knew that, or if that ever, ever came to pass that that, that was the case, because that's not how my parents raised me or my siblings. Um, it started getting a little under my skin because it sort of, it, it, from my perspective, right, reading posts, reading you know threads on 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 twitter or even in like facebook like ruby facebook groups it was mainly around volume four that i i was just very petty i think that's the best word to put it is petty because it was almost like shipping took the center stage for anything else that was happening as volume four was going yeah. on and the episode that really kind of took it over the edge for me for a bit was the episode where Blake and Son were on the ship. I think it was volume four, chapter four. Yeah. With the with the sea phalong dragon. And, you know, it was basically a Black Sun episode. Yeah. And I remembered that episode was super cool when it came out. Like, we got to see our first aquatic Grimm. Yep. It was this dragon that was, that was 
land air and sea dependable and it was just a cool fight overall we got a new song like morning follows night we got that 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 dive down attack from 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 final blake fantasy. that was like reminiscent of final fantasy 7 advent children there were so many great aspects and then like it set up for menagerie there were so many cool aspects of that of that episode and no one talked about and that. the only thing that i would ever see people talking about was this is a win for black sun Blake is going to end up with Sun, not with Yang, because this episode and because this evidence and that evidence, and these are all the things that I'm compiling about what really happened. And there was really nothing there, but obviously as a shipper, some people are going to project that and they're going to take Blake it to that. Blake blushed that one time. Yeah, so it that was the first time that I ever really lashed out in a petty way where, and I even made a made a comment. On, on a video, you know the video, we talked about it, and it was really wrong of me to do that, and I really did that at the time because, like, as I was growing on YouTube, you know, especially after Volume 3, I never thought of myself as this super popular, influential content creator that people are gonna look up to, people are gonna take my word as, as the gospel, and, like, no, like, I felt very much like the same dude who happened to get shout out from a company that is community driven and they enjoyed what I did, yeah. let's move on. And so as I was growing, I didn't realize that more and more eyes were on me and more and more eyes were judging what I was saying and what I was doing and were twisting and taking my words out of context. I said a comment almost three years ago that really focuses on the community being divided by shipping. And I've never talked about this because I, I feel like no matter what I say, there are going to there are going to be those people that. Again, they twist my words, they make it into something that it's not, and they make me out to be someone that I'm not. I've never criticized, judged, discriminated, or or made anyone feel inferior for who they love or who yeah. they're sexually attracted to. And there are people out there that say that I, I that I am that, that I'm this homophobic, transphobic asshole simply because I don't embrace shipping because I because at a point in time it was something that got to me and to be honest three years ago Arnold was pretty immature to, to react to that way a at this point now it's almost inevitable that Blake and Yang are gonna be together yeah. I don't give a shit like you, like I already told you like shipping I don't care who ends up with who I'll embrace it because I'm a Ruby fan and and ultimately if it's something that Miles and Carrie put together, I'll support it because I, I, you know what I mean? I don't think there's ever been anything in the show that's happened that I've just been like, these guys are fucking idiots. <laughs> they have no idea what the hell they're doing because I couldn't do any better. And you know what I mean? Like, you don't have to be a writer to, to criticize a writer. But for me personally, I'm not going to bash something that yeah. I've enjoyed and loved all these years. And to be honest, there's really nothing that I can say. I can obviously nitpick and say things about the show that are flaws, but... I love this show with its flaws intact because, you know, it's it it's changed my life ultimately, and and it's something that I don't get attached to many things like this, yeah. and even more so, there's not a lot of things that I can say that I've been with it from the very beginning. The only thing I can say that with is this is Ruby and Kingdom Hearts. Right. So ultimately, I I never have an issue with with shipping. I don't have an issue even with people who ship. It really comes down to the discourse that it causes. Yeah. It causes me to withdraw, to take a neutral stance and say, yeah, I don't really care. It doesn't matter to me. Oh, that song Bumblebee? Yeah, that, that song's not about Blake and Yang. Because I don't want to, I just don't want to be a part of the, dis because if I say one thing, it's, you say this thing and they're, I don't know, maybe I care too much about what other people think about me. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe that's the, the thing because I've never been in drama. I've always, I've never been the center of attention, especially in high school or in school in general. Wasn't popular, wasn't the center of attention, was never caught up in drama, would always be a bystander of drama, would always see drama happening and be like, thank God I'm not a part of that. Like that's just everybody else's life and world um, during that time. But now I'm partially in it because it's Ruby and people are bitching about Adam and people are bitching about Blake and Yang and, you know, Rooster Teeth in general. They're yeah. short, you know, things that are happening, obviously, with them as a company. And I feel trapped sometimes because I don't really want to talk about those negative things. You know, just because people are influenced or inspired by me, that doesn't necessarily mean I have all the answers or I'm going to tell you something that you want to hear. And so... 
I I don't know. And and sometimes I it it, it kind of makes me want to take a step back and it yeah. almost kind of makes me feel like oh boy i'm and in I this mean, i'm in this whether i like it or not because this yeah. is the content that i cover and people are going to want to hear those opinions and i i've never i've it's just the fact that i've never and i know this was a question about shipping yeah. but extends but it, it automatically extends from that because there are people who are like invisible in this world there are people that are aren't represented anywhere else and when they are represented in the real world, they're they're demonized, they're villainized because of who they who they are. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's very easy for most people to be dismissive, especially if they don't have a gay friend or a gay relative or something like that where it's it's normal to them. You know? That's normal to me. I have yeah. gay cousins. I you know what I mean? Like I mean, you're dating a bisexual. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on, on top of that, yeah. I mean, I I, re I I figured yeah so I don't know it's it's just it's it's normal to me but I realize that's not something that's normal for everyone and you can just see it in how people respond and how people react to certain yeah. things thinking that it's shoehorned in thinking that it's pandering thinking that it's catering to an audience when really nobody knows and we'll never know you know what I mean we'll never know what Monty's plans were up into where he passed we have no idea what was intended from day one to where Miles and Carrie are filling the well that Monty yeah. wasn't able to. You and know what I mean? things change over time as yeah. well. Like, people have to realize, even if it wasn't planned out from the beginning, that doesn't mean that adding it later is, like, a retcon necessary. Or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or it's it just happens when you're writing a story. And when you're writing a story in this way, where you can't go revise it like you can a book a million times before you publish yeah. it. Yeah. Sort of like things just things just change. Yeah, like for me, I, the the one thing that I'll say because I know going into Volume Seven, there's a lot of people. I, I you know, and I've read comments on it, especially on the videos that I've covered. I'm hyped. I'm excited for Volume Seven. I have a lot of expectations for that volume in particular. But I feel like a lot of people have this this looming cloud over their head because of not really how Volume Seven happened, but the reception in the community. How for many? Volume how six, many? You mean? Yeah, yeah, after Volume Six, like how many videos have people seen of like? Ruby is bad, or Adam was wasted potential, or yeah. Bumblebee. I can't tell you how many times I've seen Bumblebee videos since Volume Six because it's very much spelled out. Like, yeah, that's that's what they're leaning into, and that's what's most likely going to happen. And I'm happy for those who are happy. I can't yeah. really say that I'm happy for Blaking it because, again, like, I don't, as characters, yeah, that's cool. I'm 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 interested to see how they interact with each other. And how that dynamic is going to develop as time goes on. But, you know, I'm not one of those people like you that's like screaming, <laughs> screaming in Bumblebee. Yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I don't know. It, it's, it's, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm semi like afraid to, to even get involved in those kind of things because yeah. it's, it's a discourse. It's why I don't talk about politics. It's why I don't talk about sports. It's why I don't talk about religion. Number one, because I have no general, genuine interest in any three of those things. And number two, because those three topics bring out the worst in people. And so you mentioned a couple things that sort of dip into later questions. So we are going to jump around a little. Sorry bit. for rambling. It's okay. Like, so. Now that you're bringing it up, so I have a couple, I guess, like, mate, like a question and then, like, bullet points under that question. But you okay. brought up, I guess, like, the controversy and not wanting to dip into the discourse and giving your opinion on the <sighs> yeah. discourse. But at the same time, I think that people have criticized you for not saying anything yep. about certain situations, right? Like, yeah. I personally, and this is my personal opinion, I think when it matters, you have said something. When the crunch stuff came out, you posted something on Twitter. And when the gray stuff came out, you like supported the people talking about that whatever yeah um and so it's sort of like but with other stuff people have criticized you for not getting involved or letting your opinion so so here's the so things. here's the so here, here's what i'll add to that right i feel like a lot of people think that i don't say anything because i want to be in rooster teeth's good graces yeah i feel like a lot of people think rooster teeth shouted him out rooster teeth helped him grow you know, with all of these things that are happening, obviously Rooster Teeth continues to support the community in general, you know, but there are obviously those people at Rooster Teeth who know me personally, yeah. who know my videos, and I feel like people think, I don't want to say anything bad because, you know, I want to fence it rather than pick a side because that will influence the support that Rooster Teeth has given me. I don't know anybody at Rooster Teeth on a personal note. I don't have anyone's phone number. I don't really keep in touch with many people. They're busy. You know what I mean? They're content creators. I see them. I say hi. I interact here and there at RTX and I go about my business because I'm a fan just like everybody else. I'm not given any type of special treatment. But the fact of the matter is, 
that's just who I am as a person. I can easily be here. I can easily sit here and say, give up, give my take on the Vic scenario, the Shane's letter scenario, Adam scenario, Bumblebee scenario, crunch time scenario. You know, I can obviously go down all of that. I feel like that is an aspect of quote unquote drama. And it's just something that I feel is a really big waste of time. I can give an opinion. Yeah, everyone has an opinion, but that doesn't mean every opinion needs to be said. Yeah. Another thing too is just like, I don't want the perception that I'm I'm benefiting off of, you know, bad press or I'm benefiting yeah. off like of- Like if you uh, made a video about- Yeah, like if Vic I made a video stuff, about it, yeah. Stuff, like yeah, like that. if I made yeah. video about like Vic, the whole Vic scenario or the Vic situation, I don't want to feel like I'm profiting off of- Yeah. That, to me, that's, it's just, I, I don't consume any of that content and I feel like that's very quote unquote drama alert-ish. Yeah. And I, I don't give a fuck. I don't give a shit about drama. I don't want any type of drama to be the center stage of my channel. I don't want my channel to be known for, well, it's controversial. It, it's it's a hot topic. It's trendy. So I have to talk about it yeah. to remain relevant. Like, I want to talk about the characters, the weapons, the story, the lore, um, the fight scenes, and, and everything else like that. I can understand why people have that opinion. It's yeah. just... I don't know. I, I I don't like drama. I, I I feel like even in high school, like high school was like the biggest situation. I kind of looked, I felt like I was, it was beneath me to really even just be like, really, you're complaining about that girl because that girl's with that guy and you're jealous. You know, it's like, who the fuck cares? Yeah. Like, who the fuck cares? Like, I have way more important things to focus on, way more important things to spend my time and energy on than to be upset about stuff that really, you know what I mean? Like, Adam's dead. Vic has a new, you know, Crow has a new voice actor. Crunch Time, Rooster Teeth is applying that. They're learning from their mistakes. They're gonna move, the, you know, moving forward. It's unfortunate that, you know, a 13%, a like 50 people had to be fired. And, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate, but they're not just sweeping it under the rug. They at least talked about it and addressed it to an extent. Mm -hmm. And it seems like their actions are, are playing into the fact that, hey, we can't have a dark time like this happen. You know, Jeff also made that made that on that, podcast, that speech yeah. At, yeah, on the off topic podcast. It's not something they're proud of. It's not something that they they're happy that happened. It's it's sad and it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And I feel like some people and like it's like what it's like what Jeff said, like people are decry have been decrying Rooster Teeth's end for so long. I can't tell you how many people that are like, Ruby just needs to end. If volume seven isn't good, this is the end of the you know, it's the end of Ruby when they already greenlit yeah. volumes eight and nine. So that was surprising for me. I got a comment like that and it was like, I hope volume seven is good because this is their last chance. And so I'm like, for who? It's so stupid. It's so stupid. It the last I mean, like, if you if, don't like if the... it's for you, if this is like the show's last chance yeah. to get you, like that's fine. But like, it's not. I don't know. It's, I, I feel like weird. some people take it to a way higher level than what it really is. It's yeah. it's not. It's not like Ruby is not like does not make or break rooster teeth. You know what I mean? Like Ruby, I, I, personally, I feel like Ruby is just success. I, I would love for Rooster Teeth to be like, year over year, Ruby has only grown. It's only gotten better. Like yeah. viewership, monetization, all that. Cause then it would just shut down so many people who are saying like, this volume was better, that volume like, was bad. Like release their stats. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, eh, it is what it is. So I guess going off of that one, like, do you think that people have gotten entitled to your opinions on things because of your popularity. Like they think that you need to speak on it because you're the yeah. biggest voice in yeah. the community. Yeah. The problem is for those people is that I'm I'm just a humble person. I really don't think me saying anything is gonna change anything. You don't need to preach basically. Yeah, like I also I I, I don't fucking preach. Live your life. <laughs> Live your best life. I'm not gonna judge you. And, but don't come at me expecting me to speak up when I don't feel like I should or, or feel like I need to or feel that, that I want to. Um, yeah, like, and that's what I mentioned earlier about my influence. I didn't really know what influence was. You know, I'm not telling kids to go and freaking rob a bank or like eat Tide Pods or anything like, like, I don't feel like I'm going to tell people to do something and then they're going to go and do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? My demographic of viewers are around my age. So like everyone, most people who are watching my, my videos can make their own decisions and speak for themselves and, and they don't need the opinion of, 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 of a YouTuber with 90,000 subscribers yeah. to to reinforce what they believe or reinforce what they feel and vice versa. I don't need to watch anybody's videos out there to know that I don't give a shit about shipping, to know that I don't really care what the majority or what the vocal minority has to say about the controversies that happen because I don't feel like they need to be like shouted through a megaphone. Yeah. You know what I mean?
And that's the other thing I was going to ask. It's like, I think that to an extent, some people want your opinion to validate what they already Their think. Opi- yeah. Or they want you to tell them what to think, basically. They want to know how you feel about something so they can be like, well, if Arnold feels like this, I'm going to feel yeah. like that. And maybe they don't realize it, but I am I think that people do do that. So how do you feel about that specific? Like you said that you don't think of the influence, but the fact that people <sighs> may change their mind because of something that you say. Yeah. Like, how do you feel about that? I just feel like I'm not great at articulating my words. Mm-hmm. So the fact that anyone would think that I have this type of skill to, like, persuade them or convince them of of how I feel and that you should feel how I feel because here's why X, Y, and Z. I don't know. It's it's it. It's almost like, yeah, I, I do feel like it's more so like everyone already has their minds made up, but they just want to see where you fall. Yeah. You know, where you like where you fall on the line. And it's so they can either be in support of you or so that they or, or so they can be against you. So after shipping, <laughs> I was going to talk to you about theory. So you've been here since the beginning. Yeah. So what has been like your favorite theory, I guess, from the start and your favorite current theory? Does that make sense? I don't like, think I don't think anyone really right now. I don't really think anyone is doing theories as much as they used to. Yeah. I mean, I feel like theory crafting was such a big thing when Ruby was young volumes two three and kind of even four there was so much more theory crafting going on jake one man band like kind of excelled at that in that department as well with like crack theories and stuff like that eruption yeah eruption fang does those as well but i feel like the story is very laid out for us yeah i feel like there's not a lot that you can theorize like you can theorize just to theorize but i feel like most people theorize make a theory because they feel like it's possible to happen yeah you know what i mean so i'd never really gravitated much towards theories in particular i always really enjoyed breakdowns of a review of a, like of an episode or how someone feels about sequence of events that have happened um but there you know some theories obviously is crow ruby's dad yeah. did crow kill summer rose you know with his like bad that. luck semblance and stuff like yeah just general things like that um but i don't think there's much in terms of theories yeah. that you know like the wit is whitley a victim i like that theory as well i think most of the theories that i've seen have only really been from eruption fang and uh and jake mm-hmm. you know and jake did them in the past and eruption fang has done them in recent volumes so those are the only two that I that I can really think of as of right now. Theory crafting. I mean, I did a couple of theories this past volume. The Maria um, one was so good. Yeah, I, I wish. I wish, man. That's I, the worst part about making a theory, though, is when it... Is when it flops. Yeah. Is when it flops, because then it's like, and well, then this everybody is... everybody goes back and tells yeah, you how and, wrong yep, you were, and that's yep. so bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the one that I did about like the the duality of jean like with uh salem and you know jean being yeah. a, a descendant of her family that's line still, that i, I mean that's that's kind of it's like... ambiguous it's whatever even if it's not true but that one was the one that i really was surprised that a lot of people took an interest in it has like over a hundred thousand views and i'm not really great at theory crafting yeah. and i've never claimed to be and um I don't know. It's just one of those areas that I just don't have a knack for presenting myself in a, I guess, in a way that I'm just not rambling like I am now. I think that (laughs) a lot of the time it's become, instead of theories, it's ideas. Yeah. If that makes sense. Because there may not be evidence for it, but like, oh, this is a cool idea. You know, it's sort of like, I can't think of a good example right now, but like when Hunter and I theorized about, when I theorized, Hunter did not believe, um, about like the relic being a person yeah, and not just an object. Like, I guess that there was like evidence for that, like the statue of the woman and like sort of all that stuff. But at the same time, it's like, oh, that's a cool idea. Like there's yeah. not, theories have evidence. And when I look at stuff that game theory does with sort of their math and like yeah. just other like taking passages and stuff like with ruby it is i think mostly just ideas like this is a cool idea for cinder's backstory instead of this is a theory about yeah cinder uh, i'm not really big into theories as well i think the biggest parts of ruby that i enjoy is obviously seeing people's reactions seeing their reviews slash breakdown slash discussions of yeah. the episode and really i guess in a nearsighted way predicting what can happen as the episodes go yeah. on you know what i mean like People, a lot of a few people have done like their thoughts, their predictions, their speculations on what Volume Seven will deliver because now we're going to be an Atlas and it's confirmed that we'll be there for at least two volumes. So there's a lot of things that the last six volumes have set up for Atlas. You know, yeah. Faunus discrimination, Schnee Dust Company, Penny's father, 
um the winter maiden the relic like there's just so much expectations to be had yeah. you know mama shini and all that other stuff so yeah not much i can say on theories unfortunately so the last sort of subsect because these are all sort of different parts of the fandom i would say yeah um is like the criticism stuff and i think that people gave you shit when you went on fat man fallings like show thingy like their situation mm -hmm. and so how do you feel about i guess the criticism youtubers so fat man falling vexed, vexed. poor eruption fang has been like so, so i in with them too. Here, here, i mean not poor eruption fang vex and uh, mikey are great like here's here's opinion, the thing but. i love people who criticize ruby you guys I, heard it here first. I love people who criticize Ruby for, for, for multiple reasons, because sometimes they're not wrong. Okay. Sometimes they're not wrong. And two, it's an aspect of Ruby that I don't invest in myself. Like, yeah. I'm not sitting here and being like, this episode was trash, this character is poorly written. Like, no shade to anyone who does. I'm just kind of parodying right yeah, now yeah. i was like this character's trash the story's poorly written the semblance doesn't make sense how does aura work still you know we're seven volumes in it, do we have a confirmation on that like i don't do any of that shit but i love and support the people that do it and i think again it's because i'm a little different in how i approach that yeah. i have never watched any critic of rubies and have ever been personally offended by what they say yeah if they say such and such a person is a shit writer. Such and such a story is dumb. Why the hell would they? Like, I don't get offended for other people. As, yeah. I guess in a way I do. Like, obviously, it's my personal friends, family, stuff like that. But I don't think any of these critics or anybody who's critiquing Ruby or anybody who's a self-proclaimed critic of Ruby is is going out of their way to, to want to ruin someone's day or want to make someone feel bad. Yeah. or You know what I mean? Like, they're just... They're just doing what they do, you know what I mean? And that could be for any number of things. I know, you know, and that just might be who they are in, by nature, you know, deconstructing things, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, and, and bringing attention to that. I, I think I enjoy them so much because I'm able to watch it and find enjoyment in it, even though I I don't agree with, like, 90% of what they say. Yeah. And that's why I'm able to kind of break the ice and be friends and be cordial and 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 and, you know, become friends with a lot of them because... I don't take any personal qualms with what they say. That's their right to say it. And if that's how they feel, that's how they feel. I'm not going to judge them as a person based yeah. on what they say in a video. You know what I mean? One of my friends, Anton, uh, I met him after volume three. He was devastated after what happened to Pierre. And he went off like on a, an entire spiel about Ruby as a show, about her death in particular, how he felt about it. And he got a lot of negative reception because... It's not like anything that he said was, you know, con particularly hurtful. Yeah. But it's just like, he said something that I don't like, or he said something that I don't agree with, so I'm going to negative, you know what I mean? I'm going to say something against it, or downvote it, or whatever the whatever the case might be. I've never been personally offended by what anyone says about Ruby, whether it's good or bad. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have your right to say, and I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I honestly think in a way too, like, I don't see the show the same way they do. Yeah. You know, I don't see the show as a poor piece of work. I I love it and I think it's a great story and and I'm so engrossed by it that it's it's fascinating to me as well to see how someone sees the same thing that I see in a completely different yeah. light. And it kind of informs me too. You know what I mean? Cuz I can easily look at previous volumes and be like that's a yikes for me, chief. You know what I mean? Like I can easily like just for the record, I think volume 5 is the weakest volume of the show. And a lot of that comes from their videos or their critiques opening my eyes to what is being presented. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not going to change my opinion of the show overnight. It's not going to be like, wow, they've been right this whole time. Fuck yeah. this show. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's, it's none of that. It's just I'm a very open-minded person. And I, I would never take a personal offense to someone not liking something that I like. The only thing that I do think... Because there are some people like this. Are people who literally go at Miles and Carrie's throat. Like, yeah. for them as people. Like, the fact that this show was dropped on their lap. I can understand you not wanting to give a break to a writer because there's only so many breaks you can give. Yeah. And there's only so much you can do before it's like, okay, well, is this writer incompetent? Or is it, or, you know, are they trying their best? Are they giving an effort? And for that, I would say some people are a little bit more 
abrasive about it than others and that's the only thing that i don't like because it's like i feel like some of these people just don't give a shit about people yeah working on the show like miles or k i I don't know. I, I, I would wonder if some of those people would talk to Miles and Carrie that way if it was them face to face. Yeah. Versus the fact of it's my channel, it's my platform, I'm going to say what I want, how I want. But um, no, at, at the end of the day, like Fat Man Falling, Celtic Phoenix Productions, Tom, the fact that he's not doing reviews anymore breaks my heart. Any more critiques breaks my heart. Uh, I love Vex. I love all of Vex videos. Um, he's super chill as well. I love his editing as well. I've never, ever thought any of these people bad people or just party poopers because they don't see something the same way I do. Yeah. Unfortunately, not everyone feels that way. And it's, I don't know, it's very clear that that everyone is going to react differently. Some people only like hearing positive things about what they like. Some people only like hearing negative things about what they don't like. And sometimes you'll have people like me who can enjoy both. Yeah. Does it bother you, I guess, then? Because, I mean, like, I'm pretty sure every Ruby YouTuber has gotten this. It's not going to be just you, but it's also, like, I've seen this before, where it's, like, people are sort of like, well, why are you talking to that person? You shouldn't talk to them. Like, people have been that way. Like, why are you responding to Vex on Twitter, Cal? And I'm just like, because we're not mortal enemies. Like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just sort of like your viewers don't want you to be friendly with people. Because I'm not going to say friends. I don't because care. obviously we're all sort of strangers, but it's yeah. like... Like that We're like mutual friends. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? We're mutual. all we're all in the same community. We're all watching the same thing. We all have varying degrees of entertainment. The one thing is, I really hope the people who criticize the show enjoy criticizing it. Because I would hate for someone to hate this show and hate everything that it's delivered and criticize something that they genuinely dislike. Yeah. I really do feel like everyone who gives their time and energy to this show likes it. Yeah. I don't really feel like there is any black and white like you either like the show cuz if you if you don't like the show, you don't give it any quarter you don't you don't give it any type of attention, recognition, yeah. any quarter in your mind. And so I I do feel like yeah, everyone in, you know, everyone enjoys the show to a degree. It's just the fact that people have standards. Mm -hmm. You know, some have higher standards than others. Some people compare it to other things, which I feel like isn't is you know, it's comparing apples to oranges in a way, but I, again, it, it goes back to, yeah, there have been people, it, it's not really been that, it's been the opposite of people are like flabbergasted that I'm speaking to another person. I remember I posted a video, it's called the Ruby Fallacy, it's on my YouTube channel, and right. it kind of emphasizes what we're talking about right now, but it was me, Fat Man, uh, it was me, Fat Man, and Celtic Phoenix Productions, uh, Raymond. It was the three of us, it was before we were watching one of the episodes we were doing, I was with them for one of the reactions of Ruby, uh, volume six. Yeah. And I was just kind of talking about that. I was just like, I find it baffling that people really think that because I'm a very bright, positive person on Ruby as a series, and you guys are more critical, harsh, negative, that there's like, we're like water and oil. We can't, yeah. we can't, we can't ever, you know, be on the same playing field. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. It baffles me. It's it's just the fact, like, I don't know. I feel like some people... I would love to hang out with any one of them in real life. That's the extent of who I... That's the extent of how I feel that they are as people. And the fact that I detach their content so much from who they are as people. Because I feel like that's unhealthy. It's unhealthy to look yeah. at someone's video and and just say, how I'm feeling right now is is the exact personification of who that person is in real life. Yeah. Which I, I don't know how anyone can can think that way. But no, I, I love all of them. I love their content. I think what they're doing is beneficial. And it's obviously, it caters to an audience because so many fucking people watch them. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I, I, I think that they're doing great work. I love watching their videos. I can't do half of the shit that they do. I can't see half of the shit that they pick up in terms of critiques. And so that's where I find enjoyment in, in, ch in watching their stuff. So now these like are quick. Okay. Quick questions. Hot potato. Them. Yeah. All right, best Ruby scene. Fuck. <laughs> best Ruby scene. Um, best Ruby scene. Shit. <laughs> oh my god, that's so hard. Best Ruby scene. Um, volume three, chapter one, the opening scene with Ruby and her mother at her mother's grave. I love that entire scene. The sunlight, like the the was this, I think the sun was coming up. Yeah. Yeah, that entire scene was great. It felt like Ruby was Ruby was talking to her mother, but I also felt like it was a way of like Ruby the Kruby, was talking to us. the Kruby was talking about Monty yeah. as well in the same way. Yeah, I think that's 
one one of the best. I can't say that that's the best for sure, but that's the first one that I can think of off the top of my head. Worst. Or one you least oh, like. Oh, shit. Um, I, I, honestly, I, I don't know. I really love volume one. I think volume one holds a special place in my heart. I'll overlook any, any, like, blemishes that volume one has just because it's, like, it's where we all came from. It's... I fell in love with volume. I fell in love with Ruby because of volume one. Uh, worst scene. That's fucking hard. I just don't have any negative impacts of Ruby to the point where I'm just like, I'm sitting on so many bad scenes. I can't wait for someone to ask me this question. You I'll come back to volume it. Volume five. So okay, volume five. If you want to think about volume fuck, five man. in particular, any any moment in the any moment any like fighting moment in the uh, in like the final area of yeah. uh, like where they all met. Any, like, fighting moment, because, like, we we saw almost none of it. We saw, like, no fighting yeah. in that entire... The only fight scene that like we really... Like, Yang and Ruby go... Oh, my God! No, 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 no. Here's the bat. Here, here, here it is. Here's my... Here's, here's the moment that I fucking hate, right? Okay, guys. You Yang, I feel so betrayed. <laughs> because Yang and Mercury fought in Volume 3. And they teased that that was going to happen again in the Volume 5 intro. And then we see Mercury and Yang fight in volume five and i was so upset i was like are you kidding me this is the rematch yang has her robot arm mercury's got his leg obviously you know what i mean like it's just like they're like freaking cyborgs fighting and that didn't happen at all arnold's starting to sound like the video where i put mercury in the trash can <laughs> i'm just glad that they didn't show another scene of of weiss fighting emerald in the opening and then that just doesn't happen you know how many times they've done that? They've done that too many times for me to, like, not say something about it. Feels it. bad, man. All right. Best <sighs> Ruby character. We all know. Weiss Schnee. Okay. Rest in peace, Pira. She's runner-up. She's best girl Worst. as well. Worst. And, like, somebody relevant. Like, don't be like, oh, yeah, that Arslan person <laughs> from volume three. That side like, character yeah. that we'll never fucking see again. Ah, uh, that's my problem with Rooster T with Ruby in particular. It's just like you have so many awesome side characters that people really like, and you just littered a fuck ton of them, and we'll probably never see any well, of them again. Some of them are dead. That doesn't matter. Yeah, the ones that are dead are the ones that really don't matter. <laughs> like Team Bronze. They're dead. Um, <laughs> worst character, worst character, worst character. As of Volume Six, well, that cuts out like ninety percent of the cast because none Maybe. of them are from Volumes Four to Seven. It's Team Ruby, Team Juniper, or one of the one of the side people that are with them. I guess, but even like like Cinder, oh. I fucking hate Cinder. Oh, she's God. so she just wants po she's so one dimensional as a villain. I want power. I want to be strong. I want to be feared. I want to be res like what? The, who are you? Where do you come from? Like, what's your backstory? What's your history? How did you find Salem? How did Salem find you? Why do you want this power? Why are you so gung ho to go after a kid? You know what I mean? Like, it's just the fact that I know nothing about her, but she's supposed to be important. I feel like yeah. any other villain, like Hazel, for example, Hazel's like morally gray because he he doesn't want to just kill anyone. He just yeah. wants to kill Ospin. So the fact that he's got a moral compass says a lot about him. The fact that he wants yeah. to take the burden of failing a mission, even though he's not the one that did it, says a lot about him. Tyrion... He's crazy for the sake of being crazy. We know his inspiration. He's the 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 scorpion and the yeah. frog. So like Tyrion's crazy for the sake of being crazy. It's cool to have a character like that. I feel like that makes him a little one dimensional. Yeah. But if if there's more to him than than just I'm crazy because I'm a scorpion and that's what we do. It's in our nature. Then I'll appreciate that. Watt hasn't had a chance to be bad yet yeah. because we're going into his territory. We're going into Atlas where I feel like his story is gonna flourish. I'm making but videos about villains, and that's what you sound like. She's right been now. around since volume one. What has she? Who is she? What does she want? Who is she? Why should I care about Cinder? You tell me right now. Why should I care about Cinder Fall? Go watch the video where I did Cinder, oh and she was God. in a chalk outline, <laughs> like she was a dead body on yeah, the floor. Yeah, like saw... that's the. <laughs> There's your answer, uh, sis. Okay. I know. I know she's like a Cinderella reference, but like, what if I don't want to watch Cinderella? <laughs> did she have some evil stepsisters and a shitty mom that treated her badly, and that's why she wants? To be powerful, that's the only thing I can think of. We get it. The glass slipper matters, but like this is like I guess an interesting thing. Who you is would like lukewarm to you? Like you don't hate them, but you're like, like, like really man. like eh, like why? Like why? I don't know. Cause that's like 
obviously, like, I guess love and hate invoke strong feelings, but who's just like, like, bleh? Ninety <laughs> percent of the cast who isn't here post volume three. Okay. You got Team Ruby, Team Juniper. You have Ozpin, Oscar, Crow, uh, and that's really it. Okay. Those are the relevant characters of this series post volume three, and it's unfortunate because so many other great. characters. I'm so glad they gave Team Coffee a fucking book. Yep. I'm so happy that it haven't finished reading it yet. But I'm really glad that they did because... And now they're doing a sequel to that book, which will give Team Sun the fucking respect that they deserve. <laughs> yeah. Been waiting to see Sage and Scarlet since volume two when they were first premiered. Still waiting. Anyways. Let's, I guess, get to... I guess what I would perceive as sort of controversial choices. Like, some people love them, some people hate them. Okay. And that's, like, Jean, Oscar... Recently, Blake. Like, those are sort of the main three that I feel like Jean, people Oscar, either love Blake. them or hate them. I, I love the Jean. Being. I love Jean. Okay. I love Jean so much. Uh, Jean, I, I took an instant liking to him in volume one because I used to be bullied so bad as a kid. And, like, I saw so much of myself in him in volume one that it, it was really, like... It was like a freebie. It was like a brownie point yeah. that Rooster Teeth threw in there. They're like, we'll give this guy a bully arc. We'll make him feel so insecure, inadequate... And we'll win over people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I don't, I it's don't want them of, to feel it. But it's like, kind of sucky like that because it's sort of like it's the self, not the self insert, but it's sort of like it's every. A lot of people can relate it. to that. It's like the I guess a regular anime protagonist. Like they make yeah. the dude as sort of insertable as possible for you to be like, yeah, I, I can see- be like Jean. Yeah. Like you know. Yeah, and I, I just think like he's gone through a lot of shit, especially like he's the team leader and one of his teammates died and especially in the way that she died and how she was really the only one at the school that believed in him. Um, I feel like he's gone through a lot of ups and downs of picking himself back up, trying to be, try not, try not to give into the, the grieving, uh, especially, you know, with how he faced off with Cinder in volume five. I thought it was going to be much worse. I thought it was going to be to the point where like that shit was going to like eat away at him and then like kill him from the inside out. Um, but yeah, I love Jean. I really have no qualms with him as a character. I think he's, I don't want to say he's the main character, but I feel like a big part of this series has given a lot of weight to him as a character. Like he got a few arcs for himself, you know what I mean? Like the, the, the Jean arc in volume one and then in volume two with between him and Pyrrha, uh, and then like volume three, that kind of closing out with Pyrrha dying and then him kind of growing into a, a competent fighter. Now he has a semblance finally. And he's he's learned a thing or two, so. So. I love him, Oscar. Oscar. Because <laughs> you have Oscar Oscar's on probably you. the meh character. Okay. I feel like Oscar should be far more important than he is, because he's tethered with Ospin. Yeah. You know what I mean? I feel like there is potential for him, but I feel like the show is moving at such a slow pace that. You know what I mean? Like they have to face Salem in this lifetime. Yeah. But I don't think this show is going to be going on for, like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. when I first watched this show, I was like, I, I think I said it in my Volume 3 reactions. I was like, I really hope we get to see these characters as adults. Like, yeah. post-graduation with, like, maybe families. of Maybe that's an epilogue. But yeah. I really wish that we got to see that growth as the show was still going yeah. on. Not, like, as an OVA or as, like, a story like, after the show is like done. Like, Naruto? Like, because they have... Yeah, the yeah. Well, <laughs> yes and no, because I heard Boruto is really bad. Anyways. But, um, but yeah, I feel like Oscar should be far more important. I feel like the the I feel like the focus should be on him far more than it is mm-hmm. because he's just like um it's like oh you're a vessel holding the most important person in the world right now for this bigger than life story and anything could just happen to him. He goes off screen, you would think he died and no one would know. <laughs> but um but yeah, I don't know. I feel like and I love how you mention Oscar cuz I'm wearing the yeah. Oscar and Ospin shirt. Um I don't know. I feel like he should just be a far more important than what they're making him out to be. He just seems like a side character. Yeah. It's like you have the main fucking and like you have like the main adversary to Salem tethered with you. I wonder how Salem would react if she saw if she would kill him like this boy. Yeah. Just because it has, you know what I mean? I, I mean, bad, Hazel yeah. was willing to kill him. So I don't know. I'm excited. I feel like he's meh right now, but I'm excited yeah. to hopefully see him become more and more like the hunt, like the huntsman that, you know, the, I don't know, I don't know how to word it, but basically yeah. I want him to be like a top tier huntsman. Yeah. You know? Because right now he's just a fucking kid. Like, 
uh, I wasn't planning on asking this, but how do you feel about the Oscar stuff in Volume 6? Like, they left us for two weeks, and, like, people thought, like, Oscar's gonna run away! He's gonna kill oh. himself! Like, people were, like, going, like, oh. crazy with what And they he's thought. like, yeah, I went and, and got like, clothes. yeah, I got some... Mm-hmm. Like, Such how do you a feel about that? I, I feel like wh- I got whiplash on that because I felt the same way. And then I'm like, oh, shit, he's actually... Oh, he's got new clothes? That's it? <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah. In hindsight, I, I feel like a lot of things that happened in the moment for my reactions are very interesting because I feel like I feel like for everything that I reacted to, I don't feel the same way I felt about it seeing it for the first yeah. time. So I like for that moment like, you know. for that moment in particular, I feel like, wow, Oscar, you really scared us there. Yeah. <laughs> that green does not go with that orange, buddy. I'm sorry to tell you. I like your he has a cool outfit, but it's just like the emotional the emotional build up to that, especially after like freaking john just gave him like a freaking yeah just like grabbed him and just slammed him into the wall and shook him up a bit i don't know it felt very odd uh let's do blake and neo and then i have another question blake and neo yeah. i feel like neo is a bit overrated i made an entire video about that in particular um i do enjoy i do like how they kind of elaborated a bit more about how neo and torchwick's relationship yeah. was like for, for roman in particular it kind of makes me feel even worse for roman yeah you know what i mean because he kind of did all of this stuff for her and you know kept her safe and yeah. and and stuff like that and now and he's the one that died yeah. i would actually you know what i'd probably feel even worse if roman lived and neo died yeah but um i think she's stylish i think she's cool i'm pretty sure she's gonna stab cinder in the back it's almost <laughs> inevitable i wouldn't be surprised if she you know she's the ice cream you know she's ice cream girl if the ice cream girl gets the winter maiden powers, I feel like yeah. that's just. And if Cinder loses another fucking fight and comes back, I'm going to be livid. Because it wasn't really a fight with her and Ruby, but she took a she took the L from Ruby in the tower yeah. after volume three. And it's like, oh, no one knows what happened to her. Okay, she's alive, she's repairing, she's coming back. And then she fights against a maiden, gets cocky and loses. Oh, she fell off the edge. People really thought she died. I, I did not. I mean, I feel bad we for those knew. people in particular for that opinion, but... We knew, sis. Um, then she's back again, and now she's going back out again to fight. And I'm just thinking, if if they if they do this again, I don't know how I'm going to feel. Mm-hmm. The only thing that I would really like is if every time she loses, she just gets another Grim attachment. That's kind of... Until the point where she just becomes Grim. I would like that, at least, because it's like, yeah, that's the power you want, and mm-hmm. the more power you get, the less of you there is. So, <sighs> I was going to yeah. ask... And then Blake... Right, I forgot about Blake. Blake's Blake. Yeah. I don't I don't dislike her. I don't think she's all that interesting of a character beyond her arc, which is come and gone at this point. Yeah. Um I don't fucking hate her like some people like after the fucking manga, after the DC comic that came out, people like literally want her to just be fucking roasted on like in every scene that she's in to justify the fact of how she should feel or how yeah. she should have felt or how adam should have made her it's so weird man it's so crazy how how some people just i don't know i don't know i don't really think blake has had a had a good life up to now yeah you know just because she you know what i mean and that's like with anyone that's like saying oh a millionaire why are you why are you depressed why should anyone who's rich and successful and famous should be depressed. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just like, you don't fucking know what's going on in their head. Blake, if anything, she's probably the most mature character out of any of her friends. She's gone through some real life or death stuff, you know, especially yeah. in a terrorist organization. I don't know if she's gotten her hand. I don't know if she's, her, if blood's on her hands, but def- blood's definitely on her friend's hands. Yeah. You know, and, and stuff like, I don't know. I, I feel like a lot of people have a hate boner for Blake just because yeah. it's very easy to dogpile. You know, and if if one person says something that you support, then you jump on that. Then twenty people jump on that. I don't know. I think Blake's an o- an okay character. She's not. She's not in my top. I don't think she's in my top. F- she's definitely not in my top five. But she's definitely not like worst character of the year. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about I guess more Kruby related stuff. You'll understand once I start saying it. But I wasn't planning this question. You sort of reminded me. How do you feel about sort of the mystery boner that Kruby has sometimes, or the cliffhanger boner? Like, if you want to call it that. It's just, like, people have sort of said that, like, especially Volume 6, like, almost every episode just ended on a sort of cliffhanger. Whether that's justified good. Justified or justified. That's it's good. good for reactions, but do you think... No, like, I think that's good, period. Oh, okay. Like, I think, like, 
you shouldn't want everything on your plate. Like, you shouldn't want everything right out the gate, because yeah. then what the hell do you have to look forward but to? But do you think it's a contrivance? Like, they're doing it on purpose? Like, they're trying to end every episode that way? It keeps like, for things the next in- week? It keeps things interesting. Why wouldn't you? I guess. Okay. I, I think so. Like, the biggest thing, too, the biggest thing that, that built up so much hype and anticipation for a lot of people was in Volume 3, after what happened with Yang... The, you know, breaking yeah. Mercury's on. We had to wait three weeks for that one because one week was a World of Remnant. The second three week weeks was a... Is what was it? One week was... Thanksgiving? A, no, one week was, I believe, the Christmas break. The second week was a World of Remnant. And then that third week, we got the episode. So we had to wait a fucking long-ass time to get the answers. And then when we got it, when we got that next episode, it was a flashback episode. It was Cinder versus the Maiden. Right. So we had to wait, like, three, four weeks to find out what was going to happen. People were like, she's going to get arrested. Like, so many people, like, theory crafting and just speculations run wild. So I yeah. think that's great for keeping up conversation yeah. and just speculations for the next week. It just keeps things fresh and exciting. And instead of you being like, well, we got everything that episode, so I guess yeah. there's nothing to talk about until the week after because they gave us everything we yeah. wanted. I guess it's like, okay, so I guess the cliffhanger and, like, the mystery boner thing are sort of different. But you mentioned, like, Cinder earlier. Who is she? Like, what does she want? Like, that's... I think what people sort of mean when they talk about like, oh, Rooster Teeth and a lot of their shows have a mystery boner where they just sort of won't reveal hmm. things and we still haven't gotten some things. And people I said mean, that about Genlock, but like also towards Ruby, it's sort of obvious like what yeah, things have remained I mean, a mystery for too long, maybe. I uh, I don't know. I, I just think that it's just their way of, maybe it's just like a weird... It's a hard way for them to give answers without spoiling anything. Yeah. Just look at Volume 6 in particular. Look how long it took for us to get Salem and Ozpin's reveal. Yeah. Look how long it took for us to get the, re- you know, what Silver Eyes actually do and how they function, how they work. I don't really think they purposely were like, hey, we're going to make this show. We're going to wait six years before we tell them this. Yeah. It's just it's just hard for them to figure it's out the right point. It's definitely a line between, like, not giving up everything right away, but also, like, when people start to get frustrated. Like, I feel like with Cinder basically everyone's annoyed I and that's think, sort of the I issue. I think I think the reason they focused so heavily on giving so many answers in volume 6 was that one scene in volume 5 where Ruby had the floor to ask anything and she didn't. She didn't ask about what the relics do, she didn't ask about her silver eyes, she didn't ask about anything. Austin, what what's, what's your, your relate what's your relation to what's your relation to say you know what I mean yeah. like and he probably would have lied to her face anyway. Yeah. Because it, it took Jin to get the answers out of right, you know right. to get the answers that he was hiding. But I don't think that, I don't think that this is something that they're intentionally doing. I just think that for them, it's hard. They don't know how to give the answers without giving spoilers. And for the the week to week, cliffhangers, I think that's fine. Okay. I think that's fine. So let's talk about like obviously Kirby reacted to your reaction, like we got all that, but yeah. do you think it's sort of gone downhill from there in terms of community interaction? Like I think there's sort of a general theme of Kirby not necessarily interacting with people like they used to in older volumes. So here, here's my thing. I really find it annoying that people assume that because Kirby did it for me, that they have to do it for everybody. Right, right. Because in the same token, if they did it for somebody else, I wouldn't be sitting here like, where's my reaction, Kruby? I've been yeah. waiting seven years for that. Um, it's just it's just hard at the end of the day. I can honestly tell you too, like when I, was a, when I started out as a YouTuber, I was able to respond to every comment that I got. Yeah. It was very easy for me to be community focused, community oriented when I didn't have a lot of you know i didn't have a whole lot of a community in 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 the first place but now where i am now it's very hard for me to keep up with every comment i it's just physically impossible and people will tell you know i respond to comments here and there um especially if like you comment within like the first hour of a video going up i'll almost always try to give a response i read everything red versus blue people will tell you especially i read every comment and some comments i've actually incorporated in videos for like discussions and stuff like that but Rooster Teeth shows their support in so many different ways. They retweet a lot of things on Twitter. Mm -hmm. They respond directly to a few people. Like, Barbara has also um, mentioned, like, some other people's reactions that she really enjoys and even mentions, you know, called, you know, mentions them directly on Twitter. But I don't really know if my reaction should necessarily be seen as, like, this is the standard. This is what we should all be expecting for community engagement community support and if they don't react to yeah. our stuff like even casey you know she 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 did her, my her reaction 
to, to my reaction of the soundtrack last year and then Thomas this year. These people aren't obligated to do these things. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if anything, a lot of what they do for the community is based on the content that they provide. And just because you don't see every, you know what I mean? I, I, I almost also feel like my reaction should be a testament of how community yeah. driven they are or community focused they are I, because they clearly watch stuff they take they take the feedback of a lot of things people do it's just yeah. i don't even know if they would ever be even able to do stuff like that because they're so much bigger now than they were before yeah and so i guess like to rephrase like i feel like that your reaction is definitely what people see as like i guess the top not necessarily the standard yeah. but i guess what i meant was more like monty always posted stuff on twitter like what he was doing oh, and funny little okay. gags like okay. more on okay. that line like okay. people sort of think like Miles and Carrie are I don't want to say hiding themselves away and I've talked about that before like it's understandable why they may because of all of sort of the attention that they get whether that's like bad or mostly bad maybe you know Monty I mean? was just more of a social butterfly than them maybe yeah it was his creation it was his show it was very easy for him to prove and disprove what people were saying or how they were talking about it. Cause I remember like people when volume one came out, people were like sending him theories on Twitter. He'd be like, good theory, but nope, that's wrong. Moving yeah. on. And so, yeah, Monty was obviously very involved in the community of his own show, especially, but like, yeah, Miles and Carrie have been getting shat on for, for years now. And I don't blame either one of them for wanting to just keep their heads down, write, produce a volume, produce a show, yeah and then go on to the next project or focus on what they want to focus on in their spare time. Or even if the fact that they're not working, they don't want to talk about work because it just, yeah, you know, it's probably a stressful thing, especially for Carrie, um, you know, because he's the director, he's the showrunner. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that's not something he was ever expecting in the years leading up to, you know, in the first two years of the show up to where Monty died. So I don't, I don't blame them at all. And unfortunately, you know what I mean? Like they have an official Twitter yeah. I wish the people who use the official Ruby Twitter were more engaged yeah. and had more like community polls or, you know, what do you think will happen this? You know what I mean? I, I th Just general things like that, because even yeah. I do stuff like that. Like, give me the official Ruby Twitter handle, please. I mean, we've talked and, about that before. Like, obviously, this is my major, so I've criticized their social media a little bit. But it's like, do yeah. you think that if the heat gets off of Miles and Carrie, they'll sort of re-engage? I don't know. I don't really know if they ever... But that's the thing. I don't know if they ever really did. And you have to look at them personally yeah you know they can't be like oh another part of your job description you have to be interactive and engaging <laughs> you with have the to tweet <laughs> yeah you have to tweet to the you know they don't they they look at reddit and they've said that numerous times they look at everything take their word for it why the fuck do they have to lie about it right. you know don't expect anything more than that even if you you know what i mean like i know people want to feel validated i know people want to feel acknowledged and recognized when they send a tweet to someone and they want to get it back yeah. and i know that joy of getting something like that you know monty was one of the first people that i ever tweeted at someone that was like big and influential who tweeted back to me something and i what i was like I, I asked him i said what if you could have any weapon in the ruby universe what would it be like in real life and yeah. he was like crow's weapon and he said that after volume one when we didn't even know who crow was so i like he hyped me up for crow when we eventually see him in volume three but yeah. Um, okay. So now that we're sort of wrapping things up, I think that it would be interesting for you to tell people what you basically do in a day. Because I think that some of the criticism that has come your way is like, well, their reactions are easy. Arnold doesn't deserve like the success of the views or be able to do this full time. Like people have those criticisms and I'm also like, Arnold kind of does more than reactions now, so that's a little confusing. But it's yeah. like, what do you do it just really in a day? It like, let's just say in during Ruby season. During, like, oh, when the, the day the episode comes out, you watch the episode, obviously, you record your reaction. What is the rest of your day? Okay, so Saturday morning, 11 a.m., an episode, an episode of Ruby goes out. I will set up my equipment. I will hit record. I'll record my intro, move my camera over. I'll record to the my reaction of the episode 20, 25 minutes. Um, I'll give an afterthought. So that video in total will probably be about 30, 40 minutes, give or take. Immediately for his, and then from the point where that video starts editing until maybe later in the evening, I will go back and I will watch the episode two, three more times just to get uh, a better understanding of, you know, just grabbing as much information beyond the first reaction. Cause like I, I pop off in my reaction, so I don't really pick up as much the first time. Mm -hmm. And so after that, I'll try to screen cap as many screenshots for the live stream discussion that I'll do later that week. When the evening comes, I have to pivot because uh, I started this last year with volume six and I'm gonna be doing it with volume seven where I do early access 
well, my early access reactions usually go out the same day. Right. So people who are pledged to me at a certain level, they'll be able to get my reactions that day instead of waiting the whole week for it to go up on YouTube. But the same day the episode comes out, um, for patrons, for Silver Eyed Warriors and Wizards of Remnant, we do a Discord discussion where a bunch of us get together in my Discord and we talk about the episode at length. We all watch it together at the same time on Discord. And that usually goes on from for the rest of the night. So right. however however long I start it, and it can go for one, two, three, four, five hours long until people feel like we've dissected everything the episode has to offer. And that's Saturday. Sunday, I'll usually screen cap every bit of the episode as much as I can. And uh, I'll try to, so last year I wanted to do reviews. Right. And I wanted my reviews to be, quote unquote, they were called rapid fire reviews. Like the TLDR. Yeah, situation. but but different, but yeah. but way more condensed because the TLDR reviews were a big, uh, they were more meme than they were, than they yeah. had any type of substance. So I would kind of start working on like an early script of that. Um, try to figure out as many references, Easter eggs, and just try to put together the episode in the best way that I can for a script. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, it would also be different because I wouldn't be working every day. So right. I'd probably take one or two days off during that week just to kind of relax, enjoy myself, and do other things so I'm not constantly working my ass off. Uh, Wednesday, I'll put all of those screen caps that I put into OBS. I'll categorize my OBS accordingly. Thursday night, I do my live stream discussion. And that's live on Thursday, and then it's uploaded for people who missed out on it on Friday. Right. And then we start the process all over again. So let's talk about RVB. All right, red versus blue, particularly. Okay. Just the same process, because I know that you've been doing red a versus lot of blue stuff is a, for that. Red versus blue is a lot simpler. I just, I watched the entire episode. The discussions are like two hours long yeah. because I do an entire, I have a, it's not in here, but I have an entire notebook based solely on notes right. and i just go down the notes as, it's just it's basically the discussion without screenshots okay and yeah i do that week what is harder ruby obviously okay because it's up to date uh it's up to date it's it's i have a week before the next episode comes out and whatever i'm currently doing for that week is becomes irrelevant by the next week red versus blue is a lot easier because i pace myself with rvb and some people don't like that but i pace myself with it because it's 17 years of content that yeah. i'm catching up on you know and I'm 10 volumes through. And I know people sometimes get frustrated, but like someone made it made a really good point. They were like, Arnold, the level of work that you do for RVB a week is like a fucking research paper every week yeah. for college. And that's not healthy, even if you think it is. So like a research paper per week, I never even thought of that. Like how, yeah. how much I was pushing myself thinking that it was really easy, but that fatigue started picking up and, and getting to me towards the That's end of season 10. That's why I would 10. think that it's harder because yeah. of that. I mean, for Ruby, it's similar because like, I, I, I honestly finish a volume and then I can honestly, I couldn't tell you how I got through it. Like, I couldn't tell you how I got through volumes four and five and especially volume six because volume six was even, was the biggest volume of them all. So, so yeah. I mean, ultimately, they're both very similar and different in terms of how I produce both forms of content. Red versus blue is simpler because it's all it's just one thing. Whereas Ruby, I'm trying to do a reaction, yeah. a review, a live stream discussions. Every so often I'll also make like a shit posting video, yeah. like a Ruby short. Those just come to me when I think of them at the time. So those are also like supplementary. But I, I'm producing way, way, way more in a week's time for Ruby than I do for RVB. I guess this is where I let people sort of plug their stuff, but also like what is the future for you? Um, Next like let's just say a three year plan. Three years Five from years now? is too much. Okay, so three years from three now, years. I know. Like, volume seven, eight, and nine. Like, what we have been considering. Like, ten. what do you want to do in between now and then, other than... Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Um, well, Ruby's, Ruby's still going to be going on. Right. So, volumes seven's now, eight next year, nine the year after. Will you More. finish RVB by then? No. Okay. This next... Oh, wait, yeah. I'll probably will, actually. It depends if they do anything, because next year I want to be done with seasons 11, 12, and 13, right. which is an arc. It's the Chorus Trilogy. So next year I want to be done with RVB. Next year I also want to start anime content. So that might be reactions. Um, probably just only reactions, because I don't want to turn everything into like what Red vs. Blue became, because yeah. I will literally... I fucking die. Yep. Um, I also want to take Twitch, Twitch streaming a little bit more seriously. I, again, it really just comes down to time management. So, when Ruby comes out in the in the fall holiday season, it's very simple to prioritize that. 
but I feel like up until when Ruby comes out, I want to create this backlog of just anime reactions because I can really put out, I can really work on as much as I want. But the second that first video goes up, that's when the weekly schedule right. needs to be in place. So if, if I'm backlogging weeks in advance, then it, it takes a lot of the load off and a lot of the pressure off for me to be like, okay, I need to get this done by this date, this done by this day. If I already have things set up and ready, right. um, Twitch streaming is something I want to get back to doing more consi consistently. Um, the new consoles come out next year, the PS4, the PS5, um, Lots of games a lot of great year. games that I want to play. A lot of games that I feel like, like I want to play the seven remake, but I didn't play Final Fantasy seven like originally. So like, I want to do that. Persona five, the Royal comes out next year. And obviously I can only really look next year for games. Cause I don't know what the yeah, hell's going to yeah. happen two two years from now, three okay. years from now, but three years from now, the new consoles will be out. I want to be, you know, still playing video games and stuff like that. Um, it's hard to juggle YouTube and Twitch. I don't yeah. know anyone who really does both. Um, like, is a self-proclaimed YouTuber, but also a self-proclaimed Twitch streamer. Right. I'm more of a YouTuber. That's where my core audience is. Anyone who's a, who, anyone can tell you that like I I make content on you, YouTube far more than I make content on Twitch. And it's just it's hard. It's either you're all in on one or you're all in on the other or you're 50 50 on both. So you you gain and suffer a little bit on both. Yeah. But um. But yeah. Ultimately, I still want to be doing Ruby. I want to be able to incorporate anime and manga. I'll definitely be caught up to RVB by then. Hopefully, if they don't, if they're not putting out seasons as I'm reacting to seasons, right. you know what I mean. But yeah, um, that's really, that's really it. League of Legends. Oh my god, can we talk about League real quick? Oh, I'm a big League of Legends fan, right? Huge League of Legends fan. I've been playing League for just as long as I've had my YouTube channel, so six or seven years. They just announced League of Legends for console. Riot is like swing in there like they're they're just I like think they want to dip into the fortnite type you know what i mean like by putting it on console they want well, to get well, here, in on that like they're putting it on mobile too and that's a very yeah well the, the thing is the thing is it. league is the most popular pc game right yeah period so like with the exception of fortnite probably but um yeah they announced league of legends for pc and mobile they announced a league of legends animated series they announced a league of legends what do you card react to the animated series Hold on. They announced a card game and they announced a brand new first person shooter, a tactical shooter game. Uh, I don't know. I'm not really known for League of Legends. They've done a billion and one animated sh shorts already that yeah. I've seen, so I don't think I would. But what also, if I don't want to like, get. A plot? I also don't want to get copyright struck by Riot Games. I don't yeah. care if it has a plot. I still probably wouldn't do it. No. Yeah, I mean, League is very niche. If you have a PC, you've played League. If you don't. The thing is, I feel like it would be more accessible. It's going to be far more accessible for people to play League because most people that I know who know about League but have never played it because they don't have, right. they can't drop two, three grand on a PC in order to play or, you know, to just have a rig or whatever. So the fact that it's on mobile and console, I, like, I'm super excited because, like, I've always wanted my friends to play League or get into it because it has great characters, a great lore in a universe. It's just, you need a PC to play it. And I'm the right. only one of my friends who has a PC. Right. But yeah, so. I'm going to, basically what I'm saying is I'm going to become a Riot Games content creator yep. in the next you three years. You heard it here first, guys. <laughs> All right. So that is everything from us. Thank yeah. you, Arnold, for letting me kidnap uh, you. For two, uh, hours. for two hours. I'm so tired. I'm hungry. And uh, so we're going to we're gonna go get food. Uh, but yeah, obviously, like, if you're not subscribed to Arnold, I don't know like, what you guys are doing. <laughs> like, if you're not subscribed to Arnold, what are you even doing? Um, Obviously, subscribe to me. All right. I want to do more of these. I don't know who's next. A lot of people Vexed. have requested. Yeah, a lot of people have requested Vex. All right, Vex, slide into my DMs. All right. She's afraid. I'm afraid. <laughs> um, but yeah, so definitely, um, that's going to happen. I would like to do more of these. But thank you, Arnold. Yeah. This was a very, very deep, insightful talk. Can we go get food now? Yes. Okay. So thank we'll you guys for watching. See you guys later. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.